complex and enduring empires. At its height, it stretched from Europe through the Middle East to the north coast of Africa, controlling the sacred cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Its swift spread was fueled by the fervor of Islamic holy warriors, known for the speed and power of their attacks. Yet it is an empire also remembered for its cultivation of art and architecture, and the development of a legal code. This is the story of a vast and mysterious kingdom, a kingdom where sultans and pashas schemed, and a harem of concubines produced heirs for the throne. It is an empire that continues to shape our world today. This is the Ottoman Empire. It was the dawn of the 14th century. On the Anatolian plateau in what is now modern-day Turkey, nomadic tribes of Muslim Turks enjoyed a pastoral existence, breeding livestock, cultivating crops, and following the seasons with their families and their herds. But now their native lands were under siege. Barbaric hordes of Mongol horsemen were advancing from the east. Known for their swift and ruthless raids, these Mongol warriors had created a 13th century empire that stretched from Europe's eastern edge to the Pacific. Threatening on the west were Christian armies from the once great but now weakened Byzantine Empire. With their land and their way of life endangered from two sides, one man emerged as the tribe's leader. His name was Osman. He was tall, with a dark complexion and hazel eyes. He was known as a brilliant rider and swordsman. Osman was the founder of the Ottoman Empire. He surrounded himself with strong and brave soldiers. Reckless men who were superior riders and could fire their arrows on the move. They were skilled in ancient Turkish Anatolian warrior tricks, ambushes, and hit and run tactics. The key military attribute in the early years was speed. They moved very fast. They were excellent horsemen. And they used a very powerful short bow which gave them major military tactical advantage over their enemies. Contemporary accounts portrayed Osman as a man of the people, a down-to-earth leader. He dressed simply, ate with his men and shoot his own horses. He ruled from the saddle. Osman must have been a charismatic individual who combined that with a steady stream of military successes. And as the word spread that those who fought with Osman won, uh, more and more people were attracted to his banner. By the early 1300s, the Mongols withdrew, fearing the growing strength of the Ottomans. Osman then turned his attention to the Byzantines. Osman's enemy to the west, the aging Byzantine Empire, was in turmoil. It was almost a thousand years old, dating from the year 330 AD, when Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Byzantium and renamed the city Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire had once been very great, but really ever since 1204, when the Knights of the Fourth Crusade occupied Constantinople, it had, it had never recovered from the blow. And the blow it took from that experience allowed conquerors to move in from the east to capitalize on its weakness. And the last of these was the Ottomans. In the spring of 1302, fate smiled on Osman and his followers. 
unusually heavy spring rains in the Saqqara Valley. And what is now Northwest Turkey flooded the valley floor and changed the course of the river. The fortifications along the old riverbed, built by the Byzantines to protect their border, were suddenly out of position and useless. This small act of nature shifted the course of history. It gave Osman and his warriors an opening to attack. Byzantium was in a very bad way. There was, let us say, a vacuum in northwest Anatolia, a vacuum of power, and into it they went. Some later accounts of this period by Muslim scholars suggest Osman's raiders were driven by a desire to spread Islam. But more recent studies indicate their motivation was more practical. Attacking the infidels attracted many Turkish nomad horsemen, uh, very often from among rival Turkish uh, principalities who wanted to fight against the infidel, but also uh, attacking and capturing rich Byzantine towns meant more booty and spoil that were distributed among the warriors. Many of the early Ottomans were Christians. They joined Osman in a common endeavor and that was an endeavor, I think, in the very earliest stages to enrich themselves largely by the booty and slaves one got from warfare. Osman generously shared the spoils of war, and his numbers continued to grow. The Ottomans were pushing a frontier. Uh, in the 14th century, and people were very caught up in the, in the I mean, like the American West, in the um, opportunities and the romance of the frontier. In July of 1302, the Byzantines responded to Osman's raids and counterattacked with a mercenary army. Osman used tactics he had learned from the Mongols dispatched a small squad to lure the Byzantines into a deadly ambush. It was this victory that cemented the loyalty of Osman's troops. If you were a leader, the absolutely most basic thing you had to do was to get a group of fighting men who would be loyal to you, and their loyalty to you would transcend their loyalty to their tribe. Osman's principality, a small strip of land about the size of Manhattan, was born. By 1307, his fighting force, which began with less than 400 soldiers, numbered over 4,000. His followers became known as Osmanlis. Western languages translated the word as Ottomans. Osman's power grew not just from the force of his personality, but also from the belief in his divine right to lead. Osman and his followers were Sufis, members of a mystical sect of Islam that was popular on the frontier because it didn't require praying in mosques or reading from the Quran. Some Sufis worshipped in part through dance. Practitioners were known as whirling dervishes. Although we call it a dance, it's not really a dance. It's a practice for that individual to forget himself, to get connected with the universe, to feel the universe, to feel the God through that way. One night, Osman had a puzzling dream. According to a treasured Ottoman legend, he envisioned a tree growing out of his navel. Its branches spread throughout the world. He asked the Sufi Sheikh to interpret the vision. That Sufi Sheikh told him that the dream meant that he would be the founder of a huge empire with many peoples under his sovereignty and that this empire would encompass large territories and would bring much glory to the house of Osman and to Islam. 
Osman married the Sheikh's daughter. With the birth of their son, Orhan, the great Ottoman dynasty was born. Together, father and son built an army that would dominate its enemies. During the next 20 years, they plundered the surrounding countryside, expanding their territory at the expense of their rivals. Their attack was swift, but their treatment of the vanquished was fair. Unlike other conquering powers of the times, the Ottomans granted religious freedom to Christians in conquered territories. This policy would lay the foundation for the future success of the empire. I think the most important point to keep in mind about the early Ottomans is that they judged people on what they had to contribute, not ethnicity, not race, not religion. Any of the markers we use today simply don't seem to have been very important. By the time of his death in 1324, Osman had fathered an enduring dynasty. His son Orhan would build on that legacy, creating a powerful Muslim army that would soon be knocking on Europe's door. In 1324, Orhan replaced his father Osman as the leader of the Ottomans. While the father had rallied a tribe of nomads to fight for survival, the son wanted war. Orhan wasn't satisfied with capturing tribes and controlling small villages. He had bigger and more well-defended targets in mind, and new tactics were required. The first real city they take is the city of Bursa, and we know that they took it by building two castles, one on either side of the city, outside the walls of Bursa, and basically blockaded it, starved it into submission over an 11 or 12 year period. When the city finally surrenders and Orhan, the conqueror, goes into the city, he sees dead bodies and he asks the commander of Bursa, what are all these dead bodies? And he said, most of them died of starvation, which is why we ended up surrendering the city. Orhan made Bursa his new capital and declared himself king or sultan. The next challenge was governing this new territory. We can assume that Ottomans learned a lot from those people who were living in these urban centers. They acquired knowledge about architecture, they acquired knowledge about decorative styles, they acquired knowledge about how to live in an urban environment. Orhan established a monetary system and issued coins. He opened schools and built both a mosque and a monument to his father, Osman. It didn't take too long before the once nomadic Ottomans took to city life moving from tents into stone and wood houses and developing carpentry and farming skills. Now a regional power with control of trade routes, the Ottomans were a force to be reckoned with. The Ottomans managed to take some of the fortified towns of Byzantium that gave them more prestige and attracted more warriors to their camps. At the same time, in the neighboring Byzantine Empire, a continuing conflict between Emperor John Cantacuzene and a rival faction had erupted into civil war. The Byzantines had once ruled the civilized world, from the Danube to Damascus. But now Byzantine Emperor Cantacuzene was struggling to retain power. He asked his neighbor and former enemy Orhan for help. Orhan agreed seizing the opportunity to profit from Cantacuzene's weakness. And he was given the emperor's daughter in marriage as a thank you. The bargain helped them both. With Orhan's support, Cantacuzene defeated his enemies and remained in power. But Orhan got the better deal. In the early 1350s, under the guise of helping Cantacuzene, Orhan ordered 6,000 of his troops across the Dardanelles. With no opposition, his troops laid waste to the region, claimed the territory as Ottoman lands, and gained a valuable foothold in Europe. 
This marked the beginning of the Ottoman Empire's westward expansion into the Balkans and beyond. Over the next 16 years, Orhan continued to expand his territory and consolidate his power. In just 60 years, the Ottomans had risen from a tribe of nomads to become rulers of more than half a million people. In 1362, after a 38-year reign, Orhan, the first sultan of the Ottoman people, died. His son, Murad I, continued the aggressive expansion of the empire, following the same policy of tolerance as his predecessors, conquer and tax, rather than conquer and convert. The Ottomans acted in a tolerant way, but not out of any philosophical commitment to something that we would call tolerance today but for reasons of state. It was easier to uh, subdue territories uh, rather than to try and convert everybody. The Ottomans' policy of religious tolerance made administering conquered territories much easier. It reduced resistance and diminished the chance of revolt. In many areas, Christian subjects welcomed the Ottomans more as liberators than as oppressors, paying less tax to the Ottomans than they had to previous rulers. This had a kind of steamroller effect, which helps account for the speed with which the Ottoman conquests occurred, particularly in the Balkans. They simply rolled through whole areas because Yes, they fought. Whenever somebody stood out against them, they fought, and they won. But I think for every place they conquered by force of arms, they probably conquered two places by just a very effective PR system. But for Murad, new Christian subjects offered a greater opportunity. He devised a plan to create a fierce and loyal cadre of troops. Ottoman officials descended on towns in Christian territories, ordering young boys of the village to come forth for inspection. The villagers would display their youth, and the Janissary officer would go from one to the other. Height, weight, proportions. The officer would select the ones he thought would be best and took them with him. <laughs> Those selected became conscripts in Europe's first standing army, an army that would transform the continent's military landscape. They were known as new troops, or Janissaries. At first, panic spread throughout Balkan Christian communities when the Janissary recruiting officers arrived. It was a process which entailed these children being dragged, literally dragged and forced out of their families. Families begged local priests to delete their sons' names from parish registers. Some parents arranged marriages for sons as young as 12 to take advantage of the marriage exemption. But over time, attitudes changed. Families realized how prestigious the path was they knew what a promising career this could entail, and indeed not few of the more successful recruitees into this system later became very important high-ranking officials in the Ottoman state who did not forget where they came from. New recruits were brought to the Ottoman capital and converted to Islam. Allah, Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah, Allah. They underwent intense physical training and were drilled in the arts of war. The training of the Janissaries was very thorough and to a certain extent ruthless. There was a physical training, weightlifting and wrestling. They practiced the various formations. There was archery practice regularly twice a week. When their military training was complete, they were tattooed with a number and a symbol and sent out to work. First, they were sent to Turkish families. It was a very heavy physical work, uh, on farming the land. When they returned, their physical shape was much better. They were much stronger, and they knew the language. 
The strongest and brightest were sent to special schools to finish their education. Janissaries who entered what are called the palace schools got a very broad education. They were trained in Arabic, Persian, Turkish. They were certainly trained in the Islamic sciences. Everyone was taught a skill. Some were trained to play in mater bands that led Janissary troops into battle. The sound of their drums and pipes struck terror in the hearts of their enemies. The Janissary band was important to provide psychological uh, support for the Janissaries, and it was especially important before and during battles and major sieges. Janissaries who demonstrated extraordinary bravery were rewarded in later life with transfers from military service to civil service. A select few became part of the Sultan's inner palace circle, the counselors and viziers who quietly ran the government. Others were returned to their homelands as administrators. In effect, they became deputies of the Sultan's royal family. So if you had been taken, let's say, at the age of 12, had been considered one of the top-notch kids, had been sent to the palace school. By the time you're 20, 21, and you pass out of that, you become a, an officer in the corps, you can become an officer in the provincial cavalry or an officer in some of the regiments of the palace, and eventually you rise up and you could even become the Grand Vizier. The only thing you couldn't become is the Sultan, because you're not a member of the dynasty. Whether as soldiers, advisors, or administrators of far-off lands, the Janissary's sole loyalty was to the Sultan. Murad's revolutionary concept gave him firm control over all his inherited and conquered lands and turned the Ottoman state into a true empire, reaching deep into Europe. In 1389, Murad was 70 years old and still leading his troops into battle when he was mortally wounded in Kosovo. According to legend, as Murad lay dying, he named Bayezid, his younger rather than older son, to succeed him. Brooking no rival, Bayezid immediately ordered the murder of his older brother, Yakub. Murad's radical departure from eldest succession would set a deadly tradition and define the Ottoman dynasty for centuries. This whole question of being an Ottoman prince, you were going to have to kill all of your brothers, or they were going to have to kill you, it's hard to imagine. As you grow up, living what for us is the unthinkable. Over the next decade, the Ottoman Empire descended into chaos and civil war, until a new sultan emerged as one of history's great conquerors. Through the early years of the 15th century, the fortunes of the Ottoman Empire rose and fell dramatically. Bayezid's overreaching expansion in Europe and Asia ended in defeat. But the next sultan, Mehmet I, rescued the empire from chaos and civil war, and his son, Sultan Murad II, led the Janissary Corps on a successful 20-year military campaign in Europe. By the year 1444, after 23 years in power, Sultan Murad II was exhausted. Murad II was tired of the burdens of ruling and warring and negotiating and really wanted to retire and become a solitary scholar. Murad II then took an extraordinary and unprecedented step. He abdicated and handed over the monarchy to his 12-year-old son, Mehmet II. But the son's reign was brief, and Murad II's retirement was short, just two years. The rise of a coalition of his old enemies, including Hungary and Venice, sent Murad II back into battle. This time, he remained sultan until his death in 1451. When his son Mehmet II assumed the throne for the second time at the age of 19, he felt he was ready. But the Janissaries, still loyal to his father, were skeptical and rebellious. 
the troops, the Janissaries and others are used to looking to the father for leadership and guidance. And this young kid comes on the scene and people say, well, why should we take him very seriously? As the Empire again edged close to chaos, young Mehmet's enemies circled, watching and waiting. He needed a bold stroke, a conquest that would win over the skeptics. He turned his eyes to Constantinople. Constantinople was a mythic place for the Ottomans. Constantinople represented imperial power, global success. A primary motivation to capture Constantinople for Mehmet II were the words of the Prophet Muhammad himself, who said, conquering Constantinople would take a glorious army led by a superb commander. Mehmet had the confidence of a brash 19-year-old, he banished the Janissaries who challenged his rule and demanded a pledge of loyalty from those who remained. The conquest of Constantinople was actually a message to rivals in the Ottoman power structure that he was challenging their authority. Mehmet immersed himself in military manuals studying the tactics and weapons of the world's most successful armies. Mehmet was willing to do whatever it took to achieve his goal. He was studying day and night, and he was even dreaming about it. Once he ordered his vizier to the palace in the middle of the night, and he told him, Pasha, Pasha, I can't sleep because my mind is filled with thoughts about conquering Constantinople. How are we going to do this? In the spring of 1452, Mehmet ordered the construction of a new fortress just six miles from the outer walls of Constantinople. Wanting it completed quickly, the Sultan, with all the energy and impatience of youth, worked side by side with the stonemasons. Rumeli Fortress was completed in just four and a half months. He built, almost overnight, this enormous castle on the European side of the Bosphorus at one of the narrowest spots on the Bosphorus as a companion to a castle that already had been built by an earlier Ottoman Sultan on the Asian side. Together, these two fortresses would make it nearly impossible for supplies or reinforcements to reach Constantinople. Any ships that came from the Black Sea that tried to break through to help Constantinople from that side, he would shell with artillery Simply being there cut off the ability to in any way provision the city. And that is reminiscent of what we'd seen a, even a century or so earlier when the Ottomans traditionally built fortresses outside of cities that they wanted to conquer and starve them into submission. But Mehmet was not content to just wait. He marched 6,000 fresh troops into his new fortress. His intentions were clear. Byzantine Emperor Constantine XI was terrified. He immediately began to fortify the city. Imperial Constantinople in 1453 was an enormous walled structure with a few villages inside, very scattered centers of population, that basically the city had become depopulated. Yeah. While still the crown jewel of the dwindling Byzantine Empire, Constantinople was no longer the majestic, thriving capital it had once been. The population had shrunk from almost a million at the end of the 10th century to just 40,000. But as a fortress, it was still almost impregnable, with 14 miles of reinforced stone walls. In some places, two lines of walls as high as 40 feet. It was one of the strongest fortifications of its time. You can't imagine they're ever being conquered by anyone. Those great walls are what kept Constantinople from being overrun by its enemies for centuries. This gate is one of the entrances to Constantinople. 
In times of peace, the Byzantines would open these gates to the public and to soldiers so they could enter the city freely. But in wartime, when the city was under threat, they would wall up the gate like this and block the entrance in order to keep the enemy outside. As you see here, the last wall built into this gate was when Mehmet II prepared to attack the city. For months, Mehmet's spies probed the city for weaknesses. At the same time, Mehmet enlisted the help of a brilliant Hungarian cannon maker named Urban. Bizans'a top dökmek için Avrupa'dan gelmiş olan Macar asıllı topçu ustası Urban, uh... Urban had actually come to town to make cannons for the Byzantines, but Konstantin couldn't afford to pay his price. So he told Mehmet he could make him the best cannons in the world, and Mehmet agreed to pay him four times his asking price. Kendisine beklediğin dört katı Urban built a battery of advanced artillery pieces, including the world's largest cannon. With a barrel measuring 26 feet long, the giant weapon could fire a thousand pound cannonball over a mile. The explosion could be heard 10 miles away. On the eve of the battle, Constantine sent a message to Mehmet. As it is clear you desire war more than peace, so let it be according to your desire. I will defend my people to the last drop of blood. The Supreme God calls us both before his judgment seat. Mehmet responded, The holy war is our basic duty as it was in the case of our fathers. Constantinople, situated in the middle of our domains, protects our enemies and incites them against us. The conquest of this city is therefore essential to the future and safety of the Ottoman state. On April 6th, 1453, the siege of Constantinople began. April, 1453, just two years after becoming Sultan and just nine months after completing the Rumeli Fortress, Mehmet II was ready to attack Constantinople. Outside the fortress city, a hundred thousand soldiers, including a corps of elite janissaries, massed beneath the towering city walls. The troops donned chainmail armor and readied their weapons. Inside, Christian defenders braced for an attack. The Byzantine army had about 9,000 soldiers. Of course, this number was nothing compared to Mehmet II's army of 100,000 soldiers. But the Byzantines had tremendous confidence. They believed their giant moat and two lines of walls were invincible in defense of Constantinople. Mehmet's troops moved their siege towers and catapults into position and anxiously waited for the order to attack. <laughs> On April 7th, Mehmet launched the first wave of his assault against the land walls of the city. But the defenders held firm. <laughs> The Ottoman soldiers who managed to get past the moat and the first line of walls ran up ladders that they leaned on the second line of walls. But the soldiers on these ladders came up against hot burning oil called Greek fire. This Greek fire would incinerate anything, including people. Also, Mehmet had built mobile siege towers as tall as the walls themselves. But these towers were made of wood and leather, and the Greek fire would burn them all. A huge number of 
foot soldiers who were not the elite Janissaries were used by Mehmed II as cannon fodder. And they were doing the initial damage by softening the city. As ground forces continued their attack, 150 ships of the Ottoman Navy approached the city and readied their guns. Constantinople is on a peninsula, and Mehmet spies had learned that the seaward walls facing the Golden Horn were not as thick as the land walls. But when Mehmet's navy tried to attack, the Byzantines were ready. Before the Ottomans arrived, though, the Byzantines stretched a chain along the Golden Horn in order to deny access uh, to the Ottoman navy. It was important because by denying access, they could concentrate the forces along the land walls. Then Mehmet devised a remarkable plan. If he couldn't break through the blockade, he'd go around it. He would take 80 ships overland over a ridge 200 feet high and down again to the water on the other side. It is quite extraordinary when you think about ships weighing many tons, several tons at least, being dragged on rollers up a very steep hillside for several miles and then being pulled down those rollers several mi more miles. You have this vision of hundreds of oxen and thousands of log rollers probably greased with some substance or another and, and men screaming and pulling in this very dramatic scene and it probably terrified the wits out of the Byzantines. As soon as these ships made it into the Golden Horn, they started to fire on the walls. Constantine redeployed troops from the land walls, but this created a serious weakness in their defense. At the same time, teams of oxen and hundreds of men dragged Urban's monster cannon into position to assault the land walls. The giant cannon could only be fired three times a day. It would get so hot after firing that the Ottomans had to use olive oil to cool it down to prevent it from cracking during firing. The big gun along with Mehmet's other artillery batteries, pummeled the walls. Mehmet had 14 artillery batteries positioned in front of the walls, and they fired day and night. To complement the big cannons, he developed a unique firing system for destroying the fortress. The cannons would aim at three points on the walls and fire continuously at these points. On May 29th, 1453, after seven weeks of intense siege, Mehmet gave the order for what would become the final assault. First, a wave of irregulars weakened the Christian front line. Next, a second wave of regimental troops intensified the battery. Finally, a force of 5,000 Janissaries held back until the decisive moment moved in. There were two reasons for that. One is that Mehmet didn't want to waste his best troops when it wasn't clear what the outcome would be. And secondly, the Janissaries were not that happy about being used as cannon fodder, and they expected to be thrown into battle when they could decide it, and of course, rip the glory, which to a large extent they did. The wall was breached. As the Janissaries rampaged through the streets of Constantinople, the surviving Byzantine troops panicked and fled. Emperor Constantine knew all was lost. He hurled himself into the midst of the enemy and was cut to pieces.
For a thousand years, the city had been a symbol of Christian dominance. Now, the city of Constantinople was in Ottoman and Muslim hands. This had been the dream of Islamic conquerors all the way back to late in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, when the first Arab attacks were launched against the city. And now, for the first time, this 19, 20 year old upstart had done what nobody else had done. And this, of course, gave him great prestige throughout the Islamic world. In victory, Mehmet had one last concern. He was obligated by Ottoman tradition to grant three days of pillage to the conquering army. The soldiers could legally take any movable property and could rightfully enslave any of the city's population. But Mehmet had no interest in having his new capital sacked. On the second day, he entered the city at the head of a procession and put an end to the pillaging. Sultan Mehmet rode triumphantly to the magnificent church of St. Sophia and ordered it turned into a mosque. The Christian cross was torn down and replaced with a crescent, the symbol of the Ottoman Turks. The Ottomans had captured the second Rome. With the capture of Constantinople, the Ottoman Sultan became a Caesar, an emperor, the successors of Rome. The fall of Constantinople shocked Western civilization. There were ceremonies of mourning in St. Peter's in Rome. Pope Pius II urged Mehmet to convert to Christianity. Instead, this Muslim Sultan declared the city the capital of his Islamic Ottoman Empire. With this monumental victory, Sultan Mehmet had changed the course of world history and forever would be known as Mehmet the Conqueror. It was the beginning of the golden age of the Ottoman Empire. The conquest of Constantinople was a towering achievement for both the Ottoman Empire and its young Muslim Sultan, Mehmet the Conqueror. Once he conquered the city on the 29th of May, 1453, something that had been the dream of Islamic rulers for 700 years, he got unbelievable prestige. Mehmet's new capital took on a new name, Istanbul. He quickly set out to rebuild. He refortified the battered city walls, rebuilt the city skyline, and commissioned his own great mosque. What he wanted to do was to make Ottoman Constantinople, Istanbul, into the rich and powerful city that it had once been, to protect the past, incorporate it into, into the present, and use it as a foundation for his own authority and power. With a location that bridged continents and cultures, the city had prospered for centuries through trade. The new sultan ordered construction of the legendary Grand Bazaar, still the largest covered street bazaar in the world where textiles, crafts, jewelry, and spices were traded in an intricate maze of covered streets. The Ottomans stood across the major trade routes that connected Asia, China, with Europe. And Europe dearly loved Asian goods, including the spices of the East Indies. But the only way they could get those was if the goods passed through the Ottoman world. <laughs> Mehmet gathered whatever and whomever he needed. To revitalize the city's merchant class, he recruited tradesmen and craftsmen from across the empire. Everyone would take part in the city's rebirth. He invites people to come and says, if you'll come and settle in my city, I'll give you free houses, I'll give you tax breaks, you know, I'll make it economically very attractive. There are islands in the Aegean that are emptied that he simply packs them all up and says, well, you're gonna to move to my new capital now. Christians were invited back with the promise of protection. Jews in neighboring Salonika were encouraged to come to Istanbul. His idea was not simply to physically rebuild a city. It was to ensure that the city had a population with the urban skills, and that meant economic and business and trade skills that would make it the capital that he wanted to have. 
New craftsmen brought new skills. Silk from the early Ottoman capital of Bursa, along with wool, goat hair, and cotton, were woven together into intricate carpets that became the Ottomans' most famous export. In 1465, the 33-year-old Sultan Mehmet II began work on the crown jewel of his new city, the extraordinary Topkapi Palace. Topkapi Palace should be thought of as a gigantic household, consisting of concentric circles of power, the outermost circle being the least powerful. And as you get closer to the center of the palace, you get closer to the person of the Sultan, and therefore closest to the locus of power. It was intended to be both a symbol of power, but also the actual place of power. The massive 173-acre complex would ultimately include 10 mosques, two hospitals, five schools, 12 libraries, and 22 marble fountains. What you see in the background here are the chimneys of the kitchens. One of the things that I always think about when I look at those chimneys is that we call it a palace, but it was really a city. We have the registers of the food purchased and the cost and the amounts. At least 5,000 people a day were fed here. So this was a massive operation. Topkapi Palace was, in fact, a city within the larger city of Istanbul. Mehmet governed both in royal fashion. He took over much of the trappings of the Byzantine emperors, of the Eastern Roman Empire. The bread that the sultans ate came from a very special wheat grown in two villages in Bursa. And even as late as the 17th century, in the old palace in Bursa, there were 200 janissaries whose entire job in life was to sort through the flour, make sure there were no impurities, and send so many hundred pounds of this a week wherever the sultan was. The Sultan ordered two mountain villages to supply ice year-round for Topkapi. Once a week, 200 donkey loads of ice would go down to the sea, be sent to Istanbul to cool the sherbet served at the meals in the palace here. Mehmet's religious tolerance and his broad interest in art and commerce transformed Istanbul into the vibrant new center of the Islamic world. He surrounded himself with Byzantine historians, philosophers, writers, diplomats. He was interested in many of the things that his contemporaries in Europe were interested in. He was, I guess, as close as I can think of to a, a sort of Ottoman Renaissance man as one can imagine. But his civic interests didn't alter Mehmet's military goals or aggressiveness. Rebuilding Istanbul required money, and new conquests generated new revenues. For 25 years, he waged war against the Christian territories, pushing the outer boundaries of the empire into Romania, Albania, and Bosnia, and dominated his enemies. His primary goal was to conquer Christian lands, then subdue them and tax them. He pushed very hard. He's, in some ways, a kind of Napoleon-like figure. I mean, he very definitely is a dynamic and decisive military man who also has a lot of ideas that spill over in other respects. After an extraordinary 30-year reign, Mehmet the Conqueror died of natural causes on May 3rd, 1481. He was 49. Mehmet had reinvented the empire, but he had also left it somewhat exhausted. After years of constant military campaigns, the Janissaries were tired and growing mutinous. Islamic religious leaders were also angry. They resented the Sultan's attempts to assert his authority in what were traditionally religious matters. He was also a, a, a person with too much voltage. By the end of his reign, there was a real demand for a relaxation from his over-aggressive policies and a move back towards stricter Islamic norms. This struggle for control within the Islamic faith would plague Mehmet's successors. The Ottomans were heading for violent and enduring clashes within the Islamic world. 
After Mehmet the Conqueror's death in 1481, the Ottoman Empire enjoyed a period of relative tranquility under his son, Bayezid II. But Bayezid's peaceful nature and cautious approach proved to be his undoing. His sons argued for a more aggressive and forceful policy. In 1512, his son Selim won the support of the Janissaries and forced his father to abdicate. Selim's reign began brutally, even by the standards of Ottoman succession. Some historians believe Selim poisoned his father. He then ordered his two brothers and five nephews killed. Selim had come to power and maintained power by sheer force and force of personality and was quite unhesitant to utilize violence. He was also a man who ruled by fear. All Ottoman rulers had nicknames, and they sometimes are quite telling. Selim is Yaouz, which means grim or uh, mean. He probably got that nickname because he is the Ottoman ruler who turns against the older Islamic states. Islamic law prohibits Muslims fighting Muslims. But Sultan Selim claimed other Middle Eastern rulers were heretics and went on the attack. By 1517, Selim's army had swept through Iran, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt, capturing the holy cities of Jerusalem, Mecca, and Medina. These conquests earned him the title of Caliph, meaning head of Islam. Up until that time, the people they ruled were overwhelmingly Christian. It's now that, for the first time, a majority of their population were Muslim. And of course, the conquest or the incorporation of the holy cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem for the Ottomans was a prestige factor. This allowed them to see themselves and be viewed by others as the leading Islamic dynasty. But Selim didn't live to enjoy his prestigious position. In 1520, just eight years after becoming Sultan, he died suddenly of an infection. Had he lived, later Ottoman lore held that he would clearly have become Sahib Quran, that is, a world conqueror who had never been defeated in battle. Uh, he was likened to Alexander. In his short, violent reign, Selim had doubled the size of the Ottoman Empire and assumed leadership of the entire Muslim world. At the time of Selim's death, his only son, Suleiman, was the governor of Manisa province. With no brothers to battle, it was a rare instance of peaceful succession. Suleiman would go on to become the empire's greatest sultan, earning the name Suleiman the Magnificent. 16th century Europe was dominated by young and dynamic leaders, England's Henry VIII, Francis I of France, the Habsburgs, Charles V, and Russia's Ivan the Terrible. Suleiman saw himself as a major player in this world and set out to prove it. Taking the throne at age 26, he immediately launched his first military campaign. Suleiman took it upon himself uh, immediately to establish his own reputation as a, a Ghazi, as a warrior for the faith. Suleiman was able to establish himself as a commander with whom to be reckoned. Suleiman's army, led by the Janissaries, pushed deep into the heart of Europe. The city of Belgrade fell in August of 1521. The next year, Suleiman's navy captured the island of Rhodes. Suleiman kept on the attack. In 1526, his army first entered and sacked Hungarian capital of Buda. Three years later, his troops pushed all the way to the gates of Vienna. The Ottomans were now a force in European affairs. To expand the empire further, Suleiman knew he needed a stronger navy. The Ottomans are engaged in a fundamental battle with Spain for control of the Mediterranean. So there is a major superpower battle 
going on throughout the 16th century for mastery of the Mediterranean. And the Ottomans needed the very best naval commander that they could get. Suleiman offered one of the Mediterranean's most feared pirates, then called Corsairs, the role of admiral of his fleet. His name was Haradin Barbarossa. This is very, very typical of the Ottoman ability to take people on the ground who had some native talent and then turned them to their own uses. And throughout Ottoman history, if you were enough of an outlaw, if you made enough trouble for the Ottomans, eventually they'd decide to appoint you to a government post, because better to have you on their side uh, than to be making trouble for you. Barbarossa, with the backing of Suleiman, built a fleet of 200 ships. Within several years, this new navy helped create one of the largest empires in history, stretching across three continents from Russia through Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and into North Africa. Along with his military prowess, Suleiman was also a shrewd politician. When the Reformation split the Christian church in Europe into Catholic and Protestant, Suleiman took the side of the Protestants. The Ottomans favored uh, Protestantism to the extent that they did, precisely because their traditional enemies uh, were Catholic countries. So it was based on politics rather than some sort of assessment of dogma. Suleiman's backing and financial support proved crucial. Some historians even claim that the Protestant movement might have failed without Suleiman's support. Suleiman, of course, was very much concerned about his public image, and he wanted to be known as one of the, perhaps, the greatest leaders of his own age. One way to do this was to conquer, capture all these territories, defeat your enemies. Another way of doing this is to make Istanbul, the capital of this mighty Turkish Ottoman Empire, beautiful. In Istanbul, Suleiman launched a cultural and architectural revival to match that of the European Renaissance. Topkapi Palace was refashioned into the grand style of a European king. The court adopted the ceremonial style of European royalty. He called on a janissary named Mimar Sinan to create mosques and public buildings throughout the empire. Sinan was trained as a military engineer, building arsenals, bridges, and aqueducts, and he proved to be an architectural genius. Over a 40-year period, he designed and built 79 mosques, 34 palaces, 19 tombs, and more than 60 other significant monuments and buildings. In a sense, Mimar Sinan played an important role in the public relations policy of Sultan Suleiman. He created all these structures to demonstrate the glory of Ottoman Empire and Sultan Suleiman's reign. To the Europeans, he became known as Suleiman the Magnificent, but to his own people, he was called Kanuni, the lawgiver. Suleiman developed a legal system based on precedent and case law that was consistent with the sacred law of Islam. He also insisted that all new laws be compatible with Western Christian tradition. Suleiman is known as the lawgiver because he presided over an unprecedented codification of law. But among all of Suleiman's adopted Western ways, nothing proved more significant than the simple act of falling in love and getting married. Suleiman's marriage not only reshaped his reign, it would alter the course of Ottoman history for the next century. Sultan Suleiman's decision to marry for love was unprecedented and shocking. For over a century, the Ottoman monarchy had relied on slave concubines, not wives, for the production of heirs. This traditional Islamic approach had practical advantages. It produced a steady supply of princes, and unlike European monarchies that were easily derailed by one barren generation, the Ottoman dynasty survived uninterrupted for centuries. The system of the imperial harem with its own rules worked, and the rules did not include marriage. For a dynasty, it actually has an advantage because uh, one of the features of Islamic law about slavery is it says that a slave has no lineage. 
it's almost as if the Ottoman dynasty achieved a form of asexual production. Nowadays, in the Western world, we kind of think the harem as a pleasure den of the ruler. It was, in fact, an institution in which reproduction of the Ottoman dynasty was planned and enforced. The harem women were Christian slaves, either taken as prisoners of war or brought to the palace by government officials seeking favors. The Ottoman sultans and their concubines followed this very particular policy by which each concubine could only have one son. And the minute she's produced a son, she no longer sleeps with the sultan. No two princes should be disadvantaged by having to share a mother. In other words, every prince deserves his own mother. The word harem means forbidden, and the sultan's harem was housed in a beautiful but very restricted complex within Topkapi Palace. Chosen for their beauty, the women of the harem were converted to Islam and schooled in the Quran. Their role was to tend to the sultan and provide sex. They would be very attractive. Many of them were taught singing, perhaps playing a musical instrument. Accommodations within the harem were lush, especially the rooms where the sultan was entertained. Loud fountains in the windows prevented eavesdropping on private moments. At its height, over a thousand women lived in the harem, but few actually slept with the sultan. If a girl were successful, she might rise to a very powerful position. She might be the concubine of the sultan and the mother of the next sultan. It was like every little girl dressing up to be a princess, except she would have to be a slave princess. There was a strict hierarchy within the group. The most beautiful and highly trained women were allowed to sleep with the Sultan once. Among those who bore him a son, his favorites became Hasaki. These were the closest the Sultan would come to having a traditional marriage. As the size and influence of the Ottoman Empire grew, stories of concubines and the Sultan's private harem spread. European writers spun lurid tales of beautiful and naked women fueling the myth of orgies and debauchery. Well, this fantasy of the Sultan surrounded by naked women, I think probably for the most part that didn't happen, but there certainly were one or two or three Sultans for whom that was a reality. But overall, the harem operated according to strict moral codes of Islam. First of all, you have to just get out of your mind that this is something immoral or reprobate. Islamic law recognizes to reproduce with concubines as a legitimate phenomenon. A man can take a female slave as a sex partner if she is willing. And then if he has children by her, those children are legitimate if he acknowledges them. The Sultan had his own private path into the harem known as the Golden Road. The only other men allowed entrance were castrated male slaves called eunuchs, who guarded, protected, and trained the concubines. The chief eunuchs sometimes became high-ranking officers of the empire, serving just under the Grand Vizier or the Sultan's chief minister. This was a highly regimented world, until Suleiman placed his handkerchief on the shoulder of a Ukrainian slave girl named Roxolana. He instructed her to return it to his quarters that night, and thus began a romance that would change the course of the empire forever. She becomes his great love, and very special things are done for her. He breaks with a number of previous customs, traditions for her. The Sultan sold all his concubines as virgins and committed to an unprecedented monogamous relationship with Roxolana. She produced six children with him. People didn't quite understand why this sultan is having so many children with her, why he's honoring her, and they start to call her Jadu, which is Turkish for witch. Then in 1534, Suleiman made a highly controversial choice. He and Roxolana were officially married. Roxolana was not apparently so extraordinary a beauty as to inspire 
the sort of passion and devotion that the Sultan was said to have lavished upon her, and therefore it was speculated that she may have had some training in the arts of enchantment uh, that enabled her to capture the Sultan's heart in so vigorous a fashion. Whatever her wiles, Roxolana became a powerful force in the empire. Roxolana was smart, and she was very, very knowledgeable about political intrigue. We know for a fact that she got involved into palace politics, and some scholars even argue that believe that she played a role in the killing of Suleiman's own son, Mustafa, and to make place for her own sons. Suleiman accepts rumors that Mustafa is plotting to overthrow him, and he has Mustafa executed. This is a devastating thing to have to do. Roxalana gets blamed for this. She's one of the people who's saying to Suleiman, you know, Mustafa's trying to get rid of you. After Mustafa's execution, Roxalana's own son, Bayezid, died under mysterious circumstances leaving Roxolana's favorite son, Selim, as the only surviving heir. I mean, we are talking about Ottoman palace politics. You have to be smart, you have to be calculating, you have to be vicious in order to survive. Roxolana can be seen as a manipulative lady, but you have to be a manipulative lady in order to survive in that environment. Suleiman's loyalty to his wife never wavered. When Roxolana died, she was buried in a tomb designed for a queen. Eight years later, in 1566, the Ottoman Empire's greatest leader died in his sleep while on campaign in Hungary. He was 72. Sultan Suleiman really sought to create a world empire. It was certainly a single reign marked by the greatest territorial expansion. It was marked by an extraordinary degree of institutional innovation and organization. Suleiman's reign is a zenith. Suleiman's 46-year reign saw dramatic advances in law and in art and architecture. He left behind an empire far more European than the one he inherited. But the infighting and intrigue that had plagued European monarchies would soon visit the palace of Suleiman's successors. The 46-year reign of Suleiman the Magnificent marked the peak of the Ottoman Empire. For two and a half centuries, through the reign of ten sultans, the empire's growth had been fueled by the spoils of war. Now there was nothing left to conquer. It simply wasn't possible to keep on conquering. There had to be a change. They were up against borders in Europe and they were up against borders with Iran. They were going to waste their budget on unnecessary wars. Constant campaigning had honed the Ottoman war machine into an invincible force. Now idle, it declined rapidly failing to modernize either its tactics or technology. By the end of the 16th century, the Ottomans actually are surpassed by their foreign enemies, and they lose that military edge. Sultans no longer led their armies in battle. The Sultan is no longer the warrior king on horseback leading his troops on the frontiers, as they were in the reign of Suleiman. The Sultan basically stays in Istanbul and is the figurehead in a system that really is being run and controlled by others. And that system, the military and civil institutions that were so effective in building the empire, proved incapable of maintaining it. By the late 16th century, the Ottoman Empire, unable to meet the challenge of change, entered a centuries-long period of slow decline. One by one, its institutions failed. Among the first, the Ottoman tradition of dynastic succession. Fratricide may have been brutal, but it had served the Ottomans well, providing an unbroken string of 10 powerful sultans. One of the things that contested succession did, crude and barbaric as it seems to us, is it tended to eliminate weak candidates to rulership. 
Name me any European monarchy that had an unbroken succession of 10 able kings. In 1595, the most violent dynastic killings in the history of the empire put an end to fratricide. Mehmet III came to power after murdering 19 young princes. The wails and cries of the people of the city were doubled and tripled on this funeral. They simply could not bear to see this procession of coffins coming out of the palace. Some of them are, are this big, so it, it must have been terrible. And I think that was one of the pressures that persuaded the dynasty to stop doing fratricide. The sultans who followed Suleiman were, with rare exception, weak and inexperienced. Many were minors under the influence of the Valid Sultan or Queen Mother, and the palace fell victim to intrigue and infighting. The empire that had thrived for centuries with strong sultans and dominant armies now had neither. By the late 18th century, the Ottoman army, the war machine that had outmanned, outgunned, and outmaneuvered all its enemies, was in ruins. It was defeated by Russia's Catherine the Great in the Crimea in 1774, and was unable to stop Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798. The mighty Janissaries, once the tip of the sword of the Ottoman army and the training ground for the viziers and advisors who managed the empire, had degenerated into a corrupt and lawless band of rebels. They were no longer effective on the battlefield, and they were out of control. Janissaries were revolting against sultans, demanding more and more money each day, refusing to fight on campaigns, disobeying orders, and ignoring regulations. Time to time, some sultans tried to straighten out the organization, but they all failed. In 1826, Sultan Mahmud II, one of the few competent sultans to rule after Suleiman, decided to act. He trained 10,000 new troops loyal to him and attacked the Janissaries. The plan was very carefully laid. One night, they fired on the barracks where the, the Janissaries were, and the loss of life must have been huge. There were Janissaries out in the provinces too, and they were hunted down and eliminated. The Janissary era was over. In a bloody show of force, Sultan Mahmud wiped out what was left of one of history's most celebrated fighting forces. The sophisticated civilian institutions that the Ottomans had developed over centuries, tax collection systems, administrators, a complex and fair legal system, were also failing. The empire's growth had been fueled by conquest and the taxes that new territories generated. Without growth and new revenues, corruption set in. Provincial officials began selling judgeships. Merit promotion gave way to bribery and nepotism. The infrastructure collapsed. The Ottomans also failed to develop a modern economy to replace their shrinking tax base. And they faced new competition. Over time, European powers developed new sea trade routes that cut the Ottomans out of the lucrative Asian silk and spice trades. The once glorious Ottoman Empire was becoming known as the Sick Man of Europe. Mahmud II's successor, Sultan Abdul Mechid, looked to the West for help in bolstering the fortunes and the image of the empire. He was influenced by the British aristocratic class and mimicked European styles in his dress and in his surroundings. He looks very elegant. He has a half cape and some gold buttons. He doesn't wear a kaftan, as previous sultans had of the classical age. In 1843, anxious for a symbol of success, he abandoned Topkapi Palace. As the economy and governmental systems were failing, the Sultan commissioned a new and more European-style residence. The magnificent Dolmabachi Palace took 13 years to complete. The 11-acre building featured 285 rooms, 46 ballrooms, 6 Turkish baths, and 68 toilets. This part of the palace is called the Crystal Staircase. It was designed to impress visitors when they first entered Dolmabachi. In addition to the crystal balustrades, 
The ceiling itself is also built of crystal, so that the light that streams through forms a magnificent display of the seven colors of the rainbow. The ceremonial throne room was one of the largest ballrooms in Europe, designed to host state affairs for 2,500 people. The four and a half ton chandelier was a gift from Britain's Queen Victoria. This Saray, Osmanlı Devleti'nin inşa ettiği ikinci büyük saraydır. Topkapı Sarayından sonra. This palace was built to show the glamour and the wealth of the Ottomans to foreign diplomats. But the palace came at a great cost. The Ottomans had wars and economic crises, and spending billions of gold lira and tons of gold on the construction of Domobachi only made the financial situation worse. The Ottomans have declared bankruptcy in 1876, and the Ottoman debt burden is crushing, and in fact, more Europeans work for the Ottoman Debt Administration in the empire than do Ottoman officials work for the Ottoman Ministry of Finance. The reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid II would lead the Ottoman Empire into the 20th century. He continued to try to rebuild the reputation of the crumbling empire. He commissioned the most prominent photographers of the day to document the best of the empire, schools, hospitals, and manufacturing. The Sultan personally presented over 1,000 photographs to the U.S. Library of Congress and the British Museum, hoping to convince the Western world of the Ottoman Empire's technological development and industrial advances. These pictures do not, however, tell the true story. As World War I approached, the Ottomans faced bankruptcy and economic disaster. As the 20th century began, the Ottoman Empire was falling apart, stumbling from economic to political crisis. It was quite difficult and problematic for Ottomans because we see the emergence of nationalism and nationalistic ideologies during this period, especially in the Balkans first. Many of these peoples wanted to develop their own separate nationalistic identities. And some were successful in gaining independence from the Ottoman Empire. But this was not the case for the Christian Armenian minority who had lived in the region for 3,000 years. By early in the First World War, 1915, at a time when the Ottoman Empire was shrinking and besieged from all sides, the ultra-nationalist group in power, known as the Young Turks, was trying to restore the glory of their declining empire by uniting all Turkish-speaking peoples in the empire and beyond. The Armenians came under siege when in the spring of 1915, the Young Turks ordered a forced deportation of one and three quarter million ethnic Armenians out of Anatolia to Syria and Mesopotamia. The story of why and what happened is nearly a century later controversial, emotional, and hotly debated. To the Turks, the deportations were ordered because some Armenians were allying themselves with Russia, Turkey's enemy to the east. To the Armenians, this was a pretext. The deportations were ordered out of a desire to rid Turkey of Armenians forever. During the evacuation, a forced march of hundreds of miles, hundreds of thousands of men, women and children died of starvation and massacre. Newspaper reports of the time tell of horrific scenes of rape and murder. Henry Morgenthau, the American ambassador to Turkey, later wrote, I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. Estimates of total Armenian deaths in the period of the evacuations range from 300,000 to a million and a half. The Turks acknowledge that hundreds of thousands of Armenians died, but they and some historians maintain that these deaths were the result of war-caused starvation, civil unrest, and ethnic conflict. To Armenians and many historians, the actions were a clear act of genocide committed by the Ottomans, and today have been recognized as such by many countries. As the Ottoman Empire continued to fail, a power vacuum developed that the British and the French were only too happy to exploit. Both nations were establishing their own spheres of influence in the region, competing with each other and challenging the Ottoman Empire for control of the Middle East. From these troubled times, a new leader emerged, as brave and passionate about these Ottoman lands as the great sultans. His name, Mustafa Kemal.
Since its first days, the Ottoman Empire has trained many great leaders. Without a doubt, Mustafa Kemal was the last and the most famous among all these leaders. During World War I, the Ottomans sided with Germany against the forces of Great Britain, France, and Russia. At the famous Battle of Gallipoli, Mustafa Kemal earned his reputation as commander in the best Ottoman tradition. On February 5, 1915, British warships sailed towards the Dardanelles with the objective of capturing Istanbul. Ottoman troops dug into deep trenches and defended their position against thousands of Australian, British and New Zealand forces. Kemal figured out where the British might make their landing and uh, when they came, a group of Turkish soldiers were running away from the front and he appeared on the scene and he asked them, where are you going? And they said, uh, the enemy is coming. And he said, right down over that ridge. And he said, well, stop running away. Fix your bayonets, lie down, and we'll hold them off right here. And they did that and were successful in holding them off. During the battle, a piece of shrapnel hit Kamal in the chest. Miraculously, his pocket watch took the force of the blow and his life was spared. This was very important because it convinced Mustafa Kemal of his immortality. He didn't die when he should have. And so in addition to all his other virtues and his other capacities, he also now had the sense of immortality. Kemal's determination and defiance motivated all around him. His men attacked and defeated the enemy. Nine months of gruesome battle at Gallipoli left an estimated 46,000 allied and 66,000 Ottoman soldiers dead. There were over 200,000 injuries. Incredibly, the Turks had defeated their enemies. Mustafa Kemal's division had courageously and successfully defended the Ottoman lands. However, in 1918, the end of World War I meant defeat for the Germans and their Ottoman allies. The fact that the Ottomans sided with Germany in World War I is huge. It's with us even till today, because they chose the losing side of the war. There was no way the Ottoman Empire was going to be allowed to survive. After the war, in the Treaty of Sevres, the victors divided up the empire, giving portions of the Ottoman homeland of Anatolia to Greece, France, and Italy. This is the creation of the modern Middle East. I mean, this is what allowed the, the French and the British to go in and to start territorial acquisition. It was this treaty, signed by Sultan Mehmet VI, that energized the Turkish nationalist movement. The leader of this post-World War I movement was Mustafa Kemal, who emerged from the war as the only undefeated Turkish commander. Mustafa Kemal became a national hero. The uh, Turkish people found themselves a new father in the uh, presence of Mustafa Kemal, and he became the leading personality of the time. He set up a provisional government in Ankara. Over the next four years, Kemal's nationalist forces recaptured all of the occupied parts of Anatolia, what is now Turkey. He will always be remembered and venerated because there may not have been a Turkey if he hadn't led his troops, he and his fellow commanders, to secure some territory for the population. Parliament offered Kemal the Sultanate and the Caliphate, but he had other ideas. Long a critic of the corrupt rule of the Sultans, Kemal shocked Parliament by abolishing both sacred titles. He threatened his colleagues that if the proposition was not carried, some heads would be cut off. Fights broke out. Some politicians fired guns on each other, but Kemal won. Mustafa Kemal abolished the Ottoman Sultanate and exiled the last of the Ottoman sultans, and that officially was the end of the dynasty. After more than 600 years, the Sultanate of the Ottoman Empire was over. The last Sultan, Sultan Mehmet VI, left Turkey aboard a British warship. The end of the Ottoman Sultanate was a major event in Middle Eastern history. It is an event that the area is still wrestling with. 
there are hundreds of thousands of people still living in those areas that were born in the Ottoman Empire. On October 19th, 1923, the Republic of Turkey became an independent country with Mustafa Kemal as its first president. The task ahead was daunting. Turkey was on its knees, facing illiteracy, frightening poverty, inadequate health services, and a severe lack of skilled labor. Kemal separated church from state. Religious garb was banned. Ottoman clothing, and in particular the fez, was forbidden throughout Turkey. Changing headgear, which may seem very unimportant, looking back on it now, but we have to remember it was a marker of status, a marker of your place in society. And by changing from the fez to the hat, he stated that Turks were now modern. He granted equal rights to women including the right to vote, years ahead of many Western democracies. As part of his effort to westernize the country, Kemal introduced a new alphabet. Complex Ottoman Arabic was replaced by the Latin alphabet of Western languages. It's as if, for example, someone from the government coming to one of our universities in, in the United States and telling them from now on, Chinese will be your alphabet. You will use Chinese to write your own name. The same kind of thing happened in Turkey. Suddenly, literacy level in Turkey was zero in one night because of that. But Kemal's bold decision paid off. In just one year, 1928, literacy increased over 500%. Kemal instructed all Turks to adopt traditional Western-style last names. His was chosen for him. The Grand National Assembly gives him the name Ataturk, meaning Father Turk. Mustafa Kemal had a very strong personality. More importantly, perhaps, Mustafa Kemal knew what he wanted. Mustafa Kemal is responsible for making Turkey what it is today. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk is, I believe, one of the major figures of the 20th century. And on a global scale, I think, could be ranked in the top dozen or 20 figures. On November 10th, 1938, Mustafa Kemal died at the age of 57 at the Dolmabachi Palace. The clock in his bedroom remains frozen at 9.05 a.m., the time of his death. And to this day, at the same hour on the day of his death, people all over the country stop for a moment to remember Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Modern Turkey, sitting at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, continues to embrace both East and West, the old and the new. Its exotic blend of cultures, past and present, is most visible in Istanbul. Even today, with all of the skyscrapers that have appeared in other sections of Istanbul, the old section of the city is still dominated by these wonderful Ottoman imperial mosques and by the Topkapı Palace complex as well. The influence of the Ottoman Empire is felt not just in Turkey, but in the Middle East, the Balkans, North Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. Osmanlı Devleti, tarihin gördüğü en büyük üçüncü imparatorluktur. The Ottoman Empire maintained power for nearly 600 years in three continents. During these 600 years, they constructed unique architectural monuments, created millions of artistic works, and raised numerous scientists and high-quality statesmen. In the end, the Ottoman Empire remains an empire of contradictions. It was assembled by the might of its war machine, yet remembered for its development of fair and just laws. It conquered people of many faiths, yet until its waning years, it was open to the cultures and religions of the vanquished. 
But most of all, the Ottoman Empire was enduring. From its beginning in the 14th century to its dissolution in the early 20th, it spanned the reigns of nearly 40 sultans and assembled one of the largest land masses in history. And like all great empires, its legacy continues to shape our world today.